Hey guys, thanks for stopping back to Pete's Garage. Now, we're getting to that part of engine building where we have to talk about intake manifolds. That's the next step in the engine build. Uh, there are some basic design concepts I want to go over. Basic designs of intake manifolds and what they mean or could mean to the performance of your engine. How you're going to get the most out of your engine by choosing the correct manifold. You can improperly choose an intake manifold. We're going to talk about the basic design of that. Then I'm going to talk about something called volumetric efficiency. The volumetric efficiency of the manifold or its ability, the plenum and the intake runners, its ability to get air and fuel into the intake manifold, down the runners and into the cylinder head. Just to make sure you have adequate combustion or you're feeding the engine everything it needs to burn and perform like you want it to. That, that involves the swirl. You know, you talk about the vortex or the swirl or the fuel mixing together. It has to tumble as it goes into the cylinder. Well, swirl or tumble, that's what we're going to talk about when we talk about the runners and volumetric efficiency. That also is related to the uh, peak velocity of the intake manifold. The peak velocity of the air going through the manifold as it relates to the engine and how it's being drawn in. We'll talk a little bit about superchargers because superchargers come into play when you talk about intake manifolds. Turbos, we'll save that for an exhaust section, but we'll talk a little bit about superchargers, the roots or screw type. We'll talk about that very briefly. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the velocity profile. The velocity profile of the intake manifold and how the fuel comes from outside in into the cylinders and how the air and fuel that are sitting inside the intake manifold, what happens to that when you step on the gas and what that means to the velocity profile of your intake manifold. Now, that has a lot to do with the boundary layer. I've had uh, a lot of controversial comments on my video about port matching and polishing cylinder heads and intake manifolds and how much should you polish it. People saying you shouldn't polish it, you should be left rough so that the air can swirl or get the vortex going from the rough surface. I've had people say you know, it doesn't matter, but I'm going to explain the boundary layer from a physics point of view. I'm not going to use any math, just draw some pictures and show you what is actually happening in the boundary layer and what it means to your engine performance and what you can do to minimize the effect of the boundary layer. There's an effect there that it has on your performance, we'll talk about the boundary layer. And that relates, also relates to the intake port design, the intake port shape, and how that relates to your peak torque. The peak torque of your engine is what you're trying to get. You want to have torque on the low end, you want to have torque at idle, you want to have torque at a high end. What are you using your uh, uh, engine for? And how you choose your intake manifold to make sure that the, the uh, port, uh, port design or the intake that you choose is going to give you the peak torque out of the engine where you want it. Very important, we'll talk about that. And then after we're done, we'll, I'll install the manifold, we'll put it on, I'll bolt it down. Uh, before I do that, I have to, some welding, more welding to do on this one. I made this intake manifold. This is actually a stock intake manifold. It's a dual quad, dual plane Edelbrock manifold that I modified for fuel injection. And I put this uh, dual quad adapter on top, which makes it work out pretty cool for throttle bodies, which is, which is pretty neat. I also, there's a video for this view, uh, look at my other video about modifying a manifold for EFI. But I made this, I modified this manifold, manifold significantly in order to get it to run for this particular engine and feed what I need this engine to be fed with. Um, I had to do some milling on it because after I welded it, the manifold got twisted a little bit and I had to mill it, I had to mill it flat again. I had to do some machining, but we're not going to talk about that. It's all about manifold design in this video. So after I... Uh, uh, get it all welded up, finish what I got felt weld up, and then uh, when I get the uh, powder coating done, I'll put the manifold on. So let's start talking about basic designs. Alright guys, look, I know there's a lot of complicated stuff going on inside of an intake manifold. And I know a lot of it is difficult to understand when you talk about it from the physics standpoint and the math and all that crap, so I'm not really going to go through that. But there's a lot to understanding the things that make up an intake manifold and why intake manifolds are different. What is the boundary layer? What is a velocity profile? What is a peak torque curve? How do you match your, your intake manifold for those things? So it's kind of important. I'm going to go through it the long way. I know some of it's going to sound a little bit long or difficult to understand, doesn't make sense, but it's all going on in there and I figured I'd just explain it all as best as I can, as simply as I can, just to give you all the information so when you're building an engine or you have a problem, you understand what's going on, why it's happening, so if you have a problem, you at least know where to look. 
Let's continue. All right, I'm going to talk about the basics of intake manifold design. I'm going to make it short and sweet because uh, I think some of these videos are getting long and people are bored as hell with some of this information, but I'll try and make it as pertinent or salient as possible. Now, the basic concept. The basic com concept of intake manifold design is matching the intake manifold, the intake manifold, to the demands of the engine, engine demands. So you're trying to match the intake to the engine demands. So if you've been following this series, you know what volume or flow your heads have, what, how many uh, cubic inches your engine is, you know how much volume is going to be required to feed that engine. You've already under, you already understand the engine demands if you look at the previous videos. Now we're trying to match an intake to meet those demands, okay? Now, an intake manifold can be used to boost the volumetric efficiency. The volumetric efficiency at certain RPM ranges through resonance, through the intake pulses, resonance of the intake pulses, I'm going to explain it in a second, in the, in, in the intake system, and they're originated right here at the intake valve. And, and that quite simply means is this. What I mean by that is we're boosting the volumetric efficiencies at certain RPMs. Now, let, let's say this is your, you're starting at, at uh, let's say this is 100 RPM here, and you're coming along, and, you, and you're, you're giving the throttle, and you boost up, and you're at, you know, your, your red line, let's, let's, literally we can put a red line there, we don't want to do it there, and then you come, boom, down to zero. Let's say you reach peak torque right around here somewhere, let me use a different color, so it'd be easy to say, let's say you, meet, you, you, do, you run it and you run your peak torque here. You can have more RPM here and you're getting more flow through your engine, but you're getting most of your, let's say you're getting your peak torque right there. So you're trying to make sure that through this RPM range, you have to pick where on this RPM range you want your peak torque. What is your peak torque RPM? You, is it going to be a low RPM? Are you towing? Are you building a... a, a, a tractor for tractor pulling? Are you building a, a, a mid, mid RPM engine that you need RPM when you're coming around curves? Are you drag racing? Do you want to get it real close to the red line? Is that where you want your peak torque? Where do you want your peak torque to be on here? So right? So we have our RPM range and by choosing, the, by getting this different level of RPM will help you choose your intake manifold and I'll go over that with some pictures in a few minutes. But what I want to explain is I talked about volumetric efficiency and I talked about resonance tuning and, and what resonance tuning is. Uh, so we look over here and I, okay, it doesn't look great, but this is an engine block right here. Here's a block and here are the cylinder heads sitting on top of the block and here's your intake manifold right here. And here's an intake valve and I just drew it real big to make it easy to see. And resonance is, is this. When this valve opens and closes, when it opens, the air and fuel that's in here come through the cylinder head and they come into the cylinder and it burns. So the air is going this direction when the valve opens. Okay, it's going inside. When this valve shuts, or when it goes this direction, it literally shuts. And it creates a sound pressure wave. The sound pressure wave goes in the reverse direction. And I'm going to exaggerate it just so you can sort of see what I'm talking about. Let's say the sound pressure wave goes like this and it starts goes to the corner and then it bounces off here and it goes up the runner and it goes into the intake manifold right that's what happens now you can imagine where you have eight cylinders doing that back and forth and the air in here is going that way that way that way and then you have you have other waves coming in here going this way and more waves to, they're bouncing around in here and then they're going up to the top when you start getting uh, if you don't have this set right if you don't have the resonance tuning right this is where you start to get see gas spitting out the top of the engine and depending on the cam you have, and depending on, on the size of the plenum, the, in, the, the, the plenum part of the manifold, let me make sure I get some definitions here, so we all know what we're talking about. The plenum is this part of the manifold. The runners are this part that go from the plenum to the head. So if you have fuel spit now, it's because the peak wave, or the resonance tune of the intake manifold, the peak wave is right here. So when you have the pressure pulse right there, right at the bottom of the carburetor, it's going to push air past the jets and it's going to push it out of the engine. This is, this is kind of like what happens with reversion. We talk about reversion with oil flow. But this is a resonance tuning when you talk about your intake manifold. The resonance tuning of the valve putting a sound uh, pressure pulse, air pulse, back into the manifold. So now you got air trying to be fed this way and you got the pressure pulses going that way. What you have to make sure is that they're not complementary. Uh, 
if you know what complementary waves are, if I have if I have one wave that goes like this, and I have another wave that comes along, let me do it a different color. If I have another wave that comes along and goes like this, they cancel each other out because their peaks are different. But if I have the wave, this wave comes along, and then I have another wave that comes along running the same thing, they actually multiply, and you'll have t twice the wave. So if you have two waves come in this direction, you can actually multiply the resonance through your intake manifold and actually put a lot of back pressure in there. You won't have any vacuum and the engine will run terrible and you've incorrectly chosen your manifold. Well, again, I'll talk about the manifold and the volumetric efficiency when I show I'll show you some pictures, designs, etc. But I'm just trying to explain some of the things right now. So again, we're choosing our peak torque and our RPM. Now if you have a high performance engine, like I said, it's going to be near the red line. You want it near the red line of that. And the 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 peak reflection on a high, of a volumetric efficiency, peak reflection red line, be about 500 to 1,000 RPMs lower than it would be with a standard um, stock manifold from an OEM, so, uh, so to speak. Now, typically, uh, factory intake manifolds, when you buy a vehicle or they come with an intake manifold, if you pull an engine, you're rebuilding your engine, it has a factory intake manifold on it, it's usually designed where the uh, volumetric efficiency, the boost, or the boost from the intake of the volumetric efficiency, the wave, the resonance wave, the boost from that intake manifold, it's usually designed and it's optimized for peak torque RPM to make the car more responsive. They want the car to be more responsive, so they're going to design the manifold to be that way. Whereas the highly modified cars, like we're talking about high, high, high performance race cars, they're going to have the uh, produce uh, horsepower by, by, by figures by redoing the intake manifold design, like I said, and you want the uh, target peak reflection, the peak reflection of the wave it's going to be uh, closer to the red line or roughly 500 to 1000 RPM lower than the, uh, the um, factory manifold, okay? So, we talked about the volumetric efficiency. There is a calculation for that and if you want to figure it out, you can, there are volumetric efficiency calculators online, you can go look it up. You already know what your should be engine demands are, you look at it, the intake, you know what the specs are for the intake, you're going to choose. And you can kind of match those up for you as a, uh, um, which, if they're going to work out, but I'm going to go, go through that in a second. So. The other thing you have to think about is whether or not your engine is going to rely on a high tumble or high swirl. And if you have a high, high tumble engine, uh, most, most car engines, a high tumble engine is going to benefit from turbulent flow. Turbulent flow is air tumbling through the intake manifold. The air is going to tumble, it's going to tumble into the cylinder, and, and I'm going to talk about that when I talk about the uh, boundary layer inside the manifold or inside our inside our runners in a second. Whereas a higher RPM engine, RPM engine like a motorcycle engine, two-stroke engines, those kind of things, they're going to benefit more from a laminar flow, straight flow instead of turbulent flow. Uh, the, the swirling air or the high tumble of uh, the air in the intake system is going to produce a better air fuel, air to fuel mix and that's going to boost economy and uh, power delivery can, can be much as 5%. So depending on the intake manifold, you can actually get another 5% boost just from the swirl. The high swirl intake systems that use round or oval ones, like this, uh, if they have those inside the intake manifold, the uh, runner is going the, the, if these shapes are going to improve the flow of the air by mixing the air as it goes through the, uh, through the runners, if that makes sense. So, the shape of the runner is very important as well to the function of the swirl going down into the cylinder. The high tumble designs, the, the high tumble design can be detrimental though to performance because sometimes, well not sometimes, the, the uh, higher RPM, ra RPM ranges are going to benefit from laminar flow, not the turbulent, if that makes any sense. So most engines take a hit to the RPM. They take a hit to their horsepower by going with a turbulent flow versus laminar. And instead of using a square or a slightly oval runner, you're going to use something like a round and or an oval shape. And I'm going to talk about that with the boundary layer. So, in engines, uh, in engines like the the higher higher RPM ones, um, you might see an intake manifold with a square runner like this, square intake runner or tubes. Or more oval, maybe the corners are cut off so they're slightly oval. Um, the shape, and it might be narrower. They're going to be narrower, and at the same time, uh, this is trying. This is also going to um, prevent air 
from having enough room to swirl and tumble. They do that on purpose. They, that's how they create the laminar flow, by making a square or, or, or a, a slightly oval instead of a completely oval runner. And let me give you a quick example here. And I'm going to be upset because I lost my example. I lost part of my example. Where's my example? Oh, here it is. Okay. Let's pretend for a moment. Let's pretend for a moment that you are... I'm going to try and sum this up real quick for you with a little example. Let's say you're, you're lying on your back and you're laying in water and your face is covered with water. You can't breathe. Every time you open your mouth, you open your mouth and you suck in water. And I give you a choice. You can either stick this in your mouth, this little tube, and breathe through this. Would you like to try and breathe through that? Or would you like to try and breathe through this? You have two choices. And this is, sums up what I'm talking about here. If you choose this, you're not going to get a lot of air. You're going to have a hard time breathing. You're going to struggle to breathe. However, since you're breathing through such a small tube, you're going to have more velocity. The air is going to go through this tube a lot faster because it's small. So you're going to create more velocity. Just like this, with small runners on your manifold, a smaller runner, you're going to increase velocity into the cylinder. You're increasing velocity. Versus this. Now, if you breathe through this, you're going to get a lot of air really fast, and you're going to have less velocity. This is round. They're both round. One's a stir stick, and this is just a plumbing pipe, but you get the point. This has to do with matching your intake to the engine demands. Do you need high velocity to meet your torque curve for your peak torque? Do you need high velocity with a laminar flow, or do you need a lot of volume with less velocity to make sure you get the tumble to feed the engine. That kind of sums up this picture here. That's a long way to go about doing it, isn't it? Kind of stupid. I should have just showed you these two things right off the bat. But I just wanted to show you a couple things there. We're talking about the pressure waves, the resonance tuning of the manifold, how that all relates to the, uh, the plenum and the runners here, the plenum and the runners, how that gets into the head. We talked about the swirl, the RPMs, where you want your peak RPM to be, where you want your torque as relates to peak RPM, and when you choose your runner and your intake manifold, do you want velocity or do you want volume? One of the two. So, let's talk about these two. We'll talk about the, the volume and the, the compromise between plenum volume and plenum velocity. Let me erase this and we'll, uh, we'll carry on with that. Okay, now, after my ridiculously long explanation of the difference between velocity and volume, <laughs> we'll make it real simple. Here's an intake manifold. Okay, I'm not an artist, I've admitted it already, but this is an, an intake manifold. Now, here's the compromise when you're going to choose the size of your manifold and the size of the plenum. Remember, uh, let's, let's just divide this up. This part of the manifold right here is the plenum. These are the runners. Okay, you've got to make sure you keep that in mind. Very important to keep in mind. Because there's a compromise in plenum volume here and determining on what you're using your engine for. The plenum volume, you're going you're gonna to buy an intake manifold that's going to tell you the volume of the plenum. The volume of the plenum is this. A larger volume in the plenum leaves more available air to the engine within its reach. So, if you, let, let, let's draw, let me draw this a line here. This will be our dividing line right here. Okay, there's our dividing line. The air on this side of the line is immediately available to the engine. It's just sitting here. It's sitting inside the runners, it's sitting in the plenum, it's just sitting there. This is available air to the engine. The engine on this, the air, I'm sorry, the air on this side of the line has to be sucked through your carburetor. So you got your carburetor here. I'll just draw a couple little things here. So make it look like a carburetor is your ring. You know, we'll just draw a couple little, put a little spring on it to make it. And you got your linkage. So you have, the, the plenum is the air, and, and the runners, the air that's available to the engine immediately without having to go through your carburetor. That's very important. If you have a good amount of volume inside your plenum, the engine never has to work hard to get intake air because there's always enough sitting there in a large plenum, okay? As, as the plenum volume gets smaller and as you choose your manifold, OK, 
Okay, this is, you're going to show you some pictures, you're going to see what I mean. As, you're, as you choose this, and as your manifold gets smaller, let's say you, you choose, you, you're, you have a different manifold here, and it's smaller, shorter. Now what we've done is, we've taken our available air line, and we've lowered it. So now, the available air to our engine is smaller. So the available air in here, and fuel, because it's come through the carb, or with fuel injection, be dumped in right here. Here's your fuel coming in through your fuel injectors. Air and fuel, available to engine. As the plenum gets smaller, it becomes easier for the engine to rapidly consume all of this air. So as soon as you step on it, it's gonna suck this air up, it's gonna chew it up real quick. It's gonna make it very easy. It's gonna consume that air really quick in the plenum, and it's gonna have to spend a lot of air, a lot of effort to suck air through the carburetor and replenish the air that you've already uh, sucked in. Okay, does that make sense? You have to replenish the air. It's going to try and suck all the way through the intake system to get it back in, to get it in, inside of your cylinder heads. Your cylinder heads would be right here. So the size of the plenum has a big impact on how the engine is going to perform when you stomp on it. Is there air available or does it have to suck it in? That also impacts the vacuum because the larger the plenum, you have to, you have to get rid of, you have to, get all of that air and fuel has to be sucked into the engine before you suck air through the carburetor. The longer it takes to consume the air in the plenum, the longer it will take the vacuum to come up so your throttle response is going to drop. So with a smaller plenum like this, you're going to have a faster throttle response. I hope that makes sense. The, the larger plenum, like I said, the problem with the larger plenum is that it hurts the throttle response. The, the throttle response is, is, is affected by the throttle pressure. And the throttle pressure is, in other words, the throttle pressure is how fast the engine can consume all of the air in the plenum and create a significant amount of vacuum. How fast can it create, suck that air up, create enough vacuum to draw in fresh air? Pretty simple. The smaller the plenum or the runners, the higher the velocity. So now we're talking about the gas velocity. The faster the pressure drop will drop, will faster the pressure drop inside the plenum or inside the manifold, and the sooner new air will rush in for faster throttle response. So are you looking for throttle response, or are you looking for a large amount of air volume available to the engine? And there is a reason for that. So let's let me let me let me erase this, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna start talking more about the um, the different designs. Uh, well, actually. I think I can leave this up here. Um, we, I, I mentioned about OEM manifolds before, how they're designed for throttle response. The OEMs, when you buy, you're going to rebuild your engine now and you have your manifold that you're going to use, you're going to reuse that manifold. Most OEMs, they usually, they usually go for an oversized plenum with smaller throttle body. They want an oversized, throttle, uh, oversized plenum with a small throttle body so they can boost their throttle response. Is right now, as far as superchargers are concerned, let me just say this really quick. Um, I don't have to draw that. As, oh, sorry. As far as superchargers are concerned, intake manifolds have you'll, you'll have a lower diameter requirement for the throttle body and intake runners because the air is compressed. If I were to sit, a th uh, if let me let me just kind of draw this here. If I were to sit a supercharger on top of this engine right here, and the car would be on top of that, and here's our, here's our belt, but here's a supercharger. Let's say it's the root style. So I'll put kind of like a little thing there. It's a root style or a screw type uh, supercharger. Intake manifolds will have a lower diameter requirement for the throttle body intake runners because this compresses the air. It, it's forcing air in to the engine. Uh, the runner length and the resident calculations are not really affected with a supercharger because uh, the air in the manifold here is traveling the speed of sound, near the speed of sound. And at the speed of sound, it's not drastically affected by a slight increase in temperature or boost and, uh, the, uh, and boost pressure. It's not affected. So you're ramming the air in there and that it's, it's actually traveling almost at the speed of sound. Uh, it's just uh, under the speed of sound is, is uh, what, uh, sonic, sonic velocity, just subsonic, it's a subsonic velocity. So there's all different kinds of things with sonic fuel flow. I'm not even getting involved with that here because that is an uh, extremely difficult cal calculation. But superchargers, I said I would talk about that. So when you put a supercharger on there, 
uh, like something like a Roots or a screw tile, uh, screw style supercharger. In engine vacuum is not alone responsible for the throttle response. As the air is both being sucked in, it's being sucked in by the supercharger, and it's being sucked in by the piston here. It's being sucked in by the piston stroke, and it's being shoved in. It's being shoved in here by the supercharger and compressed um, as by the rotation. It becomes easier and 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 faster to fill the plenum. So the plenum gets filled faster. And this allows for an oversized manifold for higher RPM and higher volumetric efficiency while relying on the, the supercharger to take care of the gas velocity and throttle response. So you can take all of everything I just said for the last, I don't even know how many minutes, throw it all out the window. If you put a supercharger on there, if you force the air in, It'll, you don't have to worry about your plenum size. You won't have to worry about your, your residence through here because the, the the air, air and fuel will be traveling at near, near the velocity, subsonic velocity, near the uh, speed of sound. It will be, be being forced into the cylinders and you won't have, won't have any effect of the manifold, the volumetric efficiency you won't have to worry about. You won't have to worry about the RPM range and all that other stuff because the supercharger is going to be taking care of that for you. That's, that's the basic idea behind, behind manifolds. Now, let me, let, let's t before I go into showing you the specific types of manifolds, I want to talk about the boundary layer and what happened when air flows through a pipe or air flows through the runner. What is happening right here? We're going to talk about this section of the intake manifold right now. Okay, so a little bit of physics here about the design of intake manifolds and the boundary layer. What does that mean? Let me draw the line right here. There's a few things to notice about design right here. You have a pipe, okay? And let, let's say this pipe, let me just draw this kind of three-dimensional here just so we kind of know we got a pipe. All right. When air flows through a pipe, you have air, I mean, well, let's use blue, air for, blue for air. When air is flowing through a pipe like this, it's going through a pipe, it all doesn't flow at the same speed. There's something called a velocity profile of, of, of air flow. The velocity po profile has a lot to do with friction. Now, right here, right here near the edge of the pipe, there's friction. There's friction from the wall of the pipe. So the, the air over here is going to move a lot slower than the air in the middle. The air in the middle is just rubbing against other molecules, so it's going to move a lot freer through the middle of the pipe. And if you imagine this pipe as the runner or the plenum in your um, intake manifold, this is how air is going to flow through it. Air mixed with fuel. And this is where the controversy is coming in that I have with, with boundary layer and how much you should polish. We're going to talk about some little, little quantum mechanics there a little bit, a little quantum physics in a few minutes. But uh, the thing to remember here is that when air is flowing through a pipe, even if it's oval shaped, square tube, it doesn't matter, it's not flowing at the same speed. It's flowing faster through the middle, and I'll use red, and it's flowing slower on the outside. Slower, it's slower on the outside here. Slower on the outside. So if we were to look at the velocity profile of this pipe, a velocity profile of this pipe, here's our pro a pipe profile. The center air, this, this middle of the air is moving 80, usually 80% of the volume. 80% of the volume and 10% on either side is going to be running slow through the boundary layer. 80% of the volume is going to be going through the center and it's going to be going a lot faster than the air on the outside, right here. The air on the outside is going to be moving slower. The boundary layer is right here. The boundary layer is right where the air touches the metal, the boundary layer. The math that has to do with, with the boundary layers is extremely complex. But what it amounts to is this. The closer the air gets to the edge of the pipe, the velocity velocity is zero. There's actually zero velocity of the air right next to that pipe. And there's something in physics called cryogenic expansion. Uh, and it's, it's cryogenic expansion happens and you have it in your air conditioning system at home uh, and they work the same way. When you have a pressure drop and let's say you have a pipe coming and then you go to a bigger pipe like this. You go to a bigger pipe the air coming in here, all of a sudden it comes in here and it expands rapidly. As the air, air comes in, it expands rapidly, it expands, it cools 
very quickly and you get cryogenic freezing so as it cools down rapidly moisture will drop out and moisture will tend to settle along the bottom of the pipe from cryogenic expansion. Same thing with air and fuel flowing through the tube of your manifold or your intake runner. The air right next to the manifold runner is going to be moving next to zero. So if I were to draw a plenum here, again, let me, let me just draw this really quick. And uh, you know, I'll make this easier to see so I don't have so much crap on here. Let me erase this real quick. Let me just draw another plenum. We have the head. Here's our plenum sort of coming up, coming up, okay? So, if, as I said, velocity profile, remember, air in the middle. So as air is coming through your manifold, it's coming through the center, like that, air that moves through here, 80% of the air is moving at volume or velocity, a velocity. Air and the fuel right here is not moving at all. It's at zero. The velocity is zero. Down here, velocity is zero right along this edge. Zero. Zero right here. Velocity. Zero velocity as it approaches the edges. So the closer your plenum line is to the bottom of the intake manifold, the less velocity of the air you have at the bottom. Okay? Pretty simple? I think that's a pretty, pretty simple concept. So, two things. You never want the plenum to be really close to the bottom of the manifold. And if I were to draw this manifold sort of in 3D, like this, let's say you had another runner, and here's your... That was terrible. You wouldn't even know I took drafting, would you? So here's your plenum. Wow, that's really terrible. God. What do you want? I took, took drafting 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Okay, here's the top of our manifold. And here's our carburetor opening right in there. There you go. Okay? You never want this manifold to, you want your, make sure your manifold never ends right where the last runner is. You don't want this to end right here. If it ends right there, velocity of the air and fuel coming in is going to be zero right here. You're going to have zero velocity right there. And what that's going to cause is this cylinder is going to run extremely lean. These in the middle are going to run extremely rich. And the front one here over here is going to run lean. So in order to avoid that, that's not made that way. The end of the plenum is extended past the runner. So you have your zero velocity is here. Your zero velocity there. And you still have 80% of your flow still going through at regular velocity. Now, what we're going to do is, I'm going to show you real quick a couple pictures here of velocity profiles. These are actually computer measured velocities of air through an intake manifold. Okay? So, if you look at this, and I, and I hope, let me, let, me, let me move this so that you don't have that stupid ass uh, reflection from the, the lights up top. Is that better? Okay. Here's our, here's our velocity profile. Here is, let's take the plenum, and here are our runners, okay? You can see by the red, the red, the, the, and it's flowing at, in meters per second. So the red is faster, the blue is slower. That's basically way, the way this works, okay? So you see right here at the intake, where the air is coming into the plenum, the air is moving extremely fast, and as soon as it gets inside, it dissipates. The air dissipates, and it flows very, very slow. And you can see outside here at the end, it's just... The velocity is zero. The velocity is actually zero here, zero here, it's zero up around these corners right here. And as it goes through the plenum, the further away these intake runners are, right here, so I told you, remember, you don't want the plenum then right here, so the plenum is extended beyond. You get continuous airflow there, and it changes as it goes on. And this is, a, this is for a four-cylinder engine. It doesn't match what I said about the ones being lean. So this, in this particular model, the, the volume is going in, and it's keeping constant towards the back. you got a good uh, velocity profile throughout, so you'll be running good here, and then leaner up in front, the velocity profile. Now, by changing this angle a little bit, and by changing the angles of the runners, we can change the velocity profile. We can change it. Look something like this. If I were to take that, that same intake manifold, change the angle of the plenum as it relates to the bottom of the floor of the, of the uh, 
floor of the plenum or the floor of the manifold where the runners go, you can see that we get more consistent ve uh, velocity through the plenum. We got zero velocity over here. The velocity on top doesn't matter because you want the air and the fuel to flow straight down into the runners. So this is a more even, even distribution of the vo of velocity profile of an intake manifold for a four cylinder. As we go through the pictures of other intake manifolds, I'll explain and show you how this comes into play. And when you're looking at a manifold, you really don't realize it, but this is very, uh, very common design in intake manifolds to make sure that the air is coming in and it's a more uniform or smoother flow so that the velocity remains constant. We don't care about the zero velocity up here. We care about velocity going into the engine, straight down into the cylinder. So that's what a velocity profile looks like. Okay, guys, let's get into the quantum theory around boundary flow. We're not going to... Well, we're not going to really get into the quantum theory, the quantum physics particle flow and, and that, that much detail. But we're going to talk about the, the boundary layer itself. Remember I talked about a cylinder like that? And that the, uh, you know, the color here, that the boundary layer, this is right around here. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to take that boundary layer right here. And I'm going to zoom on that real close. We're going to zoom on that a thousand times, the boundary layer, okay? But before I do that, I want to talk about real quick, you know, there's a Bernoulli equations about that talks about airflow and uh, how you get lift out of an airplane and quite simply it's this, you have a, if you have an airfoil, you know, an airplane, boy is that a terrible wing, whoo, I've been drawing wings for a long time and that was one of the worst ones, you have an airfoil, like that, that's better, and you have air coming at the, at the, at the front of a wing. And so the air deflects underneath, and the air deflects on top, okay? And what Bernoulli's equation says is that the air flowing underneath here is flowing at a higher rate, and when you have an airfoil like this, you have a, a spot of a low pressure right there, and since the air is flowing slower, the pressure is driving this way. So you have air flowing faster here with low pressure here, so high pressure, low pressure, it drives the airplane up. That's how an airplane wing basically works based on Bernoulli's equations of airflow. And that comes into play in the boundary layer. Now, if we we're going to zoom in, like I said, a thousand times on a boundary layer, let's take, for example, this is a, the wall of your runner, the wall of your intake manifold, the wall of the plenum, the wall of your cylinder head, whatever. It's aluminum, it's cast iron, who cares? You zoom in on that, and here's the outside wall, but the actual wall inside is going to be really rough because it's cast or whatever it is. So we're zooming in on this thousands of times, right? So here's your cast surface. Okay? There's your cast surface. So air is flowing this way. Remember I said 80% of your airflow is going to be in the middle? And right in here is your boundary layer. So the closer we get to the boundary layer, if we get right, right, the closer we get right to here, air, the velocity is near zero. So all the air on this side, air, all the air over here is really at zero. Okay? Let's look at real close. Let's zoom in on something like this to really, really look really close at what's going on in the boundary layer. In this, in this, in this picture right here, we have our boundary layer, and I'll draw this again later. Well, maybe I can zoom in on a thousand times here. I'll leave that there so we can talk about it. I'm going to zoom in on this. So here we have a piece of aluminum, but now if we look at the wall here, here, are the, here the peaks are huge. The, the surface is rough like that. And the air is flowing this direction. Here's the airflow going that direction, right? Airflow. Now, what's going to happen in these little peaks and valleys here? The air is going to flow across these peaks. And you're going to have an area here, according to Bernoulli's equations. Oh, I just hit the camera. It's all right. Um, the, they're going to have a high pressure area right here because the air is going this way. It's going to hit the peak of the metal. Hit your peak, one of the peaks. You're going to have a high pressure area here. And right on the other side, before it hits the other peak, Right in here, you're going to have a low pressure area. So it's going to be low pressure or no pressure. So it'll be a little vacuum there, a little vacuum there. You'll have a vacuum. It's like a snow fence. You know, when the air comes across and leaves a big drift in front, and there's no snow on the ground on the other side because there's a vacuum there. It's low pressure. Nothing's going to fall there because it's a low pressure area. All the snow blows away. So the air's coming across. You have low pressure, low pressure, that kind of thing. That's the way it works. Okay? So just like just like over here where you have this is what creates the swirl okay as the air is coming down here the air is coming through here it gets across one of the corners let me erase this 
a little bit. And the air comes across here, and since there's a little pressure area, the air sort of comes in here and starts to swirl. And it swirls there. So the air will swirl here, swirl, swirl. And as it swirls, it creates a pressure area and pushes up on the air. So you get swirl up here. So the air comes up and swirls. That's what creates your swirl, is the rough, roughness of the surface there. So what happens when I port, or not port matching as much as I, if I polish or polish down the runner on an intake manifold or on a cylinder head? Uh, on my video for the intake manifold, I powder coated the inside of the intake manifold and people ask me why I did that. Why did I polish or put powder coating on the inside of my intake manifold and why did I polish the runner so smooth? They said the boundary layer, the fuel's going to fall out, it's not good for swirl, not good for air fuel mixture, and this is why I did it. So, let's say we here's here, we're looking really close at our boundary layer or our metal surface, real rough casting. What I did was, when I polished my cylinder heads, and what you do is, this is where the air is flowing, your 80%. Here's your boundary layer right here. And by polishing this down, what you end up doing is you end up taking off those peaks. So you're polishing it down, and you're taking off the piece, so you're smoothing out. You're smoothing out by polishing. You're smoothing out the layers, or the, or the peaks. So what you end up doing is, you end up taking this, the boundary layer, and you end up bringing the boundary layer, instead of it being here, you end up bringing it closer. So now the boundary layer is closer. And by bringing the boundary layer closer, I take my 80% and I move it out here. This way. So now more of my fuel flow is going at turbulent velocity because it's freeing flow here, so I got no flow. And I'm bringing my 0% velocity closer. So the more you polish down, the more you polish the intake runners on your intake manifold or the runners on your cylinder heads, the more you polish that down and the, the flatter you can make the surface, the closer you bring the boundary layer to the surface of the material. The closer the boundary layer is, the more you move out the layer where you have free flowing air. And of course you do have a boundary layer here, but it's a lot smoother. So this creates more laminar, more laminar flow instead of turbulent flow. It's more laminar. The air is going to be closer, you're going to have less turbulence there. So what I did, when I powder coated the inside of the intake manifold, I basically took all those peaks, here's, here it is, here's the peaks, and I turned them all down into nubs. They were basically all filled in with powder coat, and the intake manifold was smooth. So all of the air I have in my manifold, since it's fuel injected, will run straight through. I'm not worried about air fuel mixture in my intake manifold because it's fuel injected. I want to get all the air in as smoothly as possible and rely on the intake manifold itself to create the tumbling effect as it goes into the intake manifold. Now there's two different kinds of manifold. I hope that makes sense. The turbulent flow, the boundary layer, what's happening right near the edge of material where it gets to zero velocity. That's what's happening basically. I know it's not exactly quantum mechanics for you true mechanic, me quantum mechanics fans out there, quantum physics, but I'm not going to go through the math. Alright, so <clears throat> let's go through this. You have two types of manifolds. Before I'm going to show you some pictures right now. There's a dual plane and a single plane, and basically what this is what it says. This is what it is. A single plane manifold, and I'm going to draw a basic manifold again. Like that, and I'll just draw plenum. Here's a single plane manifold. Single plane is you have air coming in, air coming in, and it's all on one plane. It's, 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 it's all one plane, a single plane manifold. A dual plane manifold takes this air and splits it up. Now if you remember I said, remember you have, you have these waves coming in this way and they're bouncing all over the place? The way you can minimize that is go to a dual plane manifold and let me erase that. And what a dual plane manifold does is it'll take this, there'll be a center section here and it'll be par partitioned off. Okay, so what's going to happen here is as you're feeding air here, some of the air is going to go this way and this air goes this way. So you have a dual plane that actually ha will have a a base across this side on one half and on the other side. So some of the cylinders will be fed from this side, some of the cylinders will be fed from this side. So you have two planes. One plane feeds this side, the other plane feeds this side. Two planes. I'll show you a picture of that. Those are the basic two types. And that's what it means between a single plane and a dual plane. Now let's look at some manifold pictures. I think we'll go through that right now. And then, and then I'll wrap up talking about the peak torque curve. Okay guys, first manifold we're going to look at, here's a low rise 
uh, it's a dual plane manifold. You see there's two planes. One side feeds this one, uh, one side of the intake feeds this side. The other side feeds this side of the engine. It's a low rise manifold. It's not very high. It's pretty kind of close to a factory intake that you'd see something there. This is going to have a good range, maybe idle to 5,500 RPM, something like that. Uh, the, 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 look at the runner design. It's fairly consistent throughout. Uh, it's going to have a very even throttle response. Um, especially through the mid-range, idle off-range is going to be good like that. So this would be good for like cars, trucks, 4x4s, your RV, that kind of thing. It's a good all-around kind of manifold, okay? Right, there's that one. Second one we'll look at, very similar. Very similar, it's a little higher rise. Now, you can see in this one, you can see the, um, the dual plane really good. It's a little higher rise. So here, the plenum is a little bigger. So we got more air in here available. If you can look down inside here, you'd be able to see that these runners are a little larger. The plenum inside is bigger, so you have more fuel distribution. And if you see on the bottom of that intake, you see how those little got these little lines in there? Let's see. Let's see if I can highlight that. It's got these little lines in there. And, and if you were following along with the video, you know that's there to break up the fuel flow at the bottom. Because at the bottom, we'd have zero, zero velocity there. We don't want that. Zero velocity is bad. So you break up the bottom of the manifold, create high spots so that you can maintain flow, airflow and fuel flow throughout the entire manifold. Again, similar uh, runner design, uh, short and pretty consistent throughout. So you get a good torque range, however, since you have a more available air, it's going to be a little slower on throttle response, but better on higher RPM. Higher end RPM. So a little more performance oriented type manifold for this one. Then we go to something like, let's see here. Okay, here's tunnel ram. We talk about tunnel ram's manifold. Uh, you got two different, two completely different intakes. So you're feeding these cylinders here with this side, these cylinders facing this side. You got dual quad or dual carb, whatever you want to put on there. And now this talks into our torque range velocity. See the shape of the runner, how it gets smaller at the bottom? The shape of the tube on the runner, or the shape of the runner, cross section of that runner, is going to tell you all the way up here as it gets smaller, it's going to have higher velocity at lower RPM, more volume at larger RPM. So when you talk about drag racing and high RPM applications, this was, what this would be used for, this manifold is perfect for that application. You've got a lot of volume in here, that you're going to get a lot of velocity through here at low RPMs, and especially when you get it up to the red line, it can perform more efficiently because you get the volume. There's a huge amount of volume available to the engine to suck in. There's a, the high rise, that's what you do is a, use a tunnel ramp for. That kind of thing. Last one I'm going to show you. This is more this is well this is exactly this one is exactly the manifold that I used to build the one that I was that I'm using in this engine build it's a dual quad dual plane intake manifold and then again you notice the intake runner shape here how it's larger and it gets smaller so it got increased velocity it's going to have good idling a good velocity to idle however it's got the volume to give what it needs through the torque range particularly through the mid range to higher RPMs which is what I'm looking to get at I want to get off the line quick, we'll have decent throttle response. Now, how do you get decent throttle response out of a higher rise dual plane manifold? Take a real close look at this. You see how the bottom of this manifold is lifted off the bottom? And I'm gonna, we're gonna go look at my manifold real quick after I show you this, but you can see that the bottom is sort of hollow. It's hollow underneath here. So instead of taking this manifold and squish, uh, squishing it down, you lift the manifold up, you make a real small uh, plenum on top, and you run the runners off of that. That's a way to make the plenum a lot smaller, is to put a big gap underneath it. Quite simply, this is for a Ford versus a Chevy, but it's the same kind of idea. It's just short of being a tunnel ram because it's higher, so you get the velocity at lower RPMs, but it's going to have a good torque range throughout all the way up through uh, close to red line. So this is the kind of manifold we got. Um, let's go take a look at that. I'll show you my manifold. You can, this is how it looked when I started, and what I did was I put the ports in there for the fuel injectors and I put the big plate on top of there to seal this off and this is made for carbs I converted mine to make for throttle bodies to make it for fuel inject so let's go look at that manifold really quick and we'll show you what that what the design considerations are there this is the same intake manifold that was in that picture and as I said the, uh, the first of all you see how the plenum is off the bottom I can put my hand in here and there's all the way straight through the bottom the manifold or the plenum is lifted off the bottom of the the intake okay so that's how we take this plenum take this plenum and make it smaller if this were all the way down to the bottom the plenum would be huge it would be just a tunnel ram so this is a dual plane so if I look inside 
You can see I got one side feeds this side of the engine, the other side feeds the other runners. You can almost see that from the side here. See how these runners are fed off of different parts right here. Okay, and what I did was I added the fuel injector, I welded the bung in for the fuel injector right there. And I also added this plate on top. You can see the difference. The carburetor would be right here. The throttle bodies are out to here. So I had to make a plate and weld it on here to make the throttle bodies fit. That's what I did there. So again, this is just dirty. It's going to sandblast and powder coat real nice when I get to that point. But the basic design is a dual plane, dual quad, small runner. Now look at the runner design. See how it's big here? Runner design, how it gets smaller. The runner gets here smaller so that you get more velocity up here through uh, idle. And then as the uh, um, RPM, as I go up through the RPM range, you have a large volume of here available. There's a large volume of air inside the plenum available for the engine to get uh, the throttle response it needs to because it's going to consume this air very, very fast. So what I did is, if you've been following, I added this on. Now this plate is a half inch thick here. I took this half inch plate and welded it on top of the manifold and what I basically did was I increased the vo volume of this plenum by adding this on top. And when by doing the calculations, by adding that plenum, I have more volume available that's in the plenum so it's going to affect my throttle response a little bit, just a teeny weeny bit at the bottom, but since there's two throttle bodies that are put on here at 1050 CFM a piece, I'm putting 2100 CFM a flow through this, this manifold and that is huge. So it's not going to take long for this thing, this motor to ramp up to full RPM, get up to uh, torque it needs and there's going to be a ton of air going through this manifold. It definitely is not going to be the bottleneck. I'm putting a lot of air through this thing right past these huge big injectors. I got 90 pound injectors jamming the fuel right into the intake, into the runners, into the cylinder heads. So, we talked about flow and the boundary layer, right? Now when I got so much velocity here and I poured it and polished the heads, that air is going to get, let me move this over, I'm going to take this off for a second. Okay, let me set that down. And if we look at the runners here, I've polished these pretty good. The runners are polished. Let me go on this side because it's more light. See, I polished those down. And if you look at the, down the intake here, the air is going to travel, and there's the intake valve right there. So what, maybe, I don't know, three inches? The air only has to travel three inches before it gets in the cylinder. I'm not worried about swirl. I just want to get the air and fuel dumped into the cylinder, and I'm counting on the shape or design of the dome on the piston, or the dish in my particular engine, to do the swirl for me. And I've had no problems with that. That you can use the piston to create the swirl inside the cylinder. Now if it was carbureted, I'd have some different considerations. But since it's fuel injected, that's what I'm going with there. So I pick up my manifold. And it's really hard to handle with one hand. Put it back on. And that's the way it sits. So I still have some, like I said, welding to do. And I'm going to powder coat that. And I'll put that on. But let's go talk about the peak torque to RPM. And then we'll wrap that up. So if we talk about real quick make this real short, relationship of intake port, uh, intake port to torque peak. Uh, now for a given runner, we talked about a runner, right? Now if I were to take that runner, take a cross section of that and look at it, and regardless if it's oval, round, or whatever, so we're going to take our shape. Let's say it's a, we have a, an oval shaped, God, I am terrible drawing in this video. I'll tell you, i got to slow down. If I slow down, langsam in German, slow down, take it easy. If I take my in, uh, cross section of my port, and as it goes down, it's going to get smaller, right? We're talking to smaller, it's going to slow, get smaller, so velocity is going to increase. If I look at the intake port design, the cross section area of the runner, it affects the location of an engine's peak torque in the RPM band. So the cross section has a lot to do with it. The runner length and the shape is also very important, but the cross sectional area will be the strongest determining factor in where your RPM band falls in the engine's torque, where the torque peak is. Basically, the smaller the runner diameter, the smaller you get in the runner diameter, the less potential there is. We talked about potential air, that's air available to the engine. As the runner gets longer, so if we have a runner that's that long versus if a runner that's that long, as we, as, as we did in the manifold we just looked at, it's got longer runners because the plenum is raised off the bottom. So the longer the runner, as the runner gets longer, the inertia and the column of air will increase in the flow at lower RPMs. So you get stronger flow at lower RPMs and will and will tend it'll it'll decrease a little bit 
uh, in flow at the higher RPMs, but it's okay. Once again, the intake in the inlet port cross section will be the main detriment of total potential airflow. So when you look at your runner shape, and if it's and and if your runner intake is coming in, if it's getting smaller, so you got uh, increased velocity. If it's straight, your intake runner straight, you're gonna have lam or laminar even airflow. So you'll never see this. You'll never see a runner design design like this. Because what you're going to have here is a pressure drop and it will flow terrible. It will never work that way. So the cross section of the area is huge when you look at it. Um, it's, it's a little more complex. You've got to make sure you match it with your cam. You've got to know what your heads are doing. That kind of thing. So keep in mind that the calculations that go into conjunction with this are pretty complex. So find a, uh, an application online or a calculator for uh, airflow and, and try and put your input, uh, your engine in there. Um, en engine information in there to calculate your, your flow, what's going to work best for your engine. I'm sure you can talk to technical support at Edelbrock or whatever you're going to buy your uh, manifold and they'll give you a lot of help. But regardless, your, if your camshaft is, let, for, for example, let me give you an example. If your, let's say your camshaft is designed to peak at 4500 RPM, okay? But your manifold and your headers are, are peaked at 6500. That's where your manifold is peak RPM. Your actual torque range, your, 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 your torque range is going to fall somewhere between there. You don't know. It's going to fall somewhere between there. And it's going to have the unusual, um, unusable, or the usable torque band right here where you're going to place your peak RPM, which is not matched very that well. On the other hand, if you take your, uh, in match your intake, let's see, I don't want to be confusing. I'm going to try to say this slow. If you match the intake, headers, heads, and camshaft all for 5,000 RPM, your cam and everything is matched right at 5,000 RPM, the torque peak will fl fall very, very close to 5,000 RPM. That's very important, important to consider when you're purchasing your manifold. Where do you want your peak torque to fall? Keep in mind that the peak torque and peak horsepower do not occur at the same RPM. So when you get your engine dynoed, you're going to have, you might have peak RPM at maybe, let's say, uh, uh, let's just make these numbers close. You might have your peak horsepower at 4880 for your peak horsepower, okay? And the peak torque might occur at 5000. So you get your most horsepower at 4880 and, and most of your torque at 5000. It all depends on how you put your engine together, okay? So guys, what I'm basically trying to say is this. You don't have to understand all the math. You don't have to stand, understand all the physics of what's going on inside an intake manifold. You don't have to understand all of that stuff because there are professionals out there, experts in the field, that are willing to help you when you build your engine. But, like I said earlier, I, want you to, I wanted to help you understand what is going on inside, why it's happening, so that when you put an engine together, and if you're having trouble tuning it, if you're having trouble getting it to run correctly, if you're having trouble down the road, if you understand the why or the how, it helps you solve problems quicker for troubleshooting. If you're trying to tune the engine, you kind of understand what's going on inside the manifold. If you understand what's going on, you might say, hmm, maybe I'm having trouble with compression. Maybe I'm having trouble with velocity. Maybe I'm trouble having trouble with volume. Those are all related to how the engine runs. I hope that's not confusing. I got more work to do on that manifold. I got, like I said, I got some things I got to weld up, then I'm going to powder coat it and clean it up, get the engine ready for installation. So I'm going to do that in another video. I just wanted to, I'm going to wrap this one up now so I at least can get something on YouTube for you guys to watch. A little food for thought. Watch it a million times, critique it, and tell me where I'm wrong. I know I said a lot of things and it was really, really tough. I had to make a lot of notes and I actually made a lot of sections of this a few times because after I watched it, I realized I didn't explain it that well, so I did it again and again and again. This has been one of the most complex or difficult videos to make because of everything that's going on inside of an intake manifold, and I didn't want to say it wrong, and I didn't want to say it that was so complex that it didn't make sense. If that makes sense at all, I don't know. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it helped you at all. Uh, I hope to help you understand more about intake manifolds that's going on inside. If you have any questions, again, leave me a comment. And I'll answer it if I can. Thank you to everybody who sends me text messages asking me questions about their engines. People from England, Australia, Japan. I got people from all over the world sending me questions. And it's great to hear what's going on in other parts of the world, what people are doing, how to build, how they're getting horsepower, uh, where it really counts. Like in Europe, they don't want the eight cylinders, they don't want the four, they got to get it out of the horsepower of it. In Australia, they don't have the big V8s. I love hearing from guys in Australia because they're guys in Australia are great. They're just like, 
want to get out there. They want monster horsepower, but they want it in a little package. Awesome stuff. Thanks. Thanks for all your text messages, your emails. I love it. Um, I try and answer as quick as possible, and you guys are great. I love all the things you share with me. I'm learning as you guys share information because I hear stuff that I never heard of before. I hope you enjoy this. Thank you very much. Thanks for stopping by Peach Garage.